This is YOLO, short for You Only Look Once, an object detection neural network. This incredible piece of technology can detect multiple objects including people, cars and more. And all of that in real time. But how do neural networks see? Like in this image, how does it actually detect this bird? At a high level, the neural network dissects the image into parts and examines each part individually. It finds something of interest, it marks it. This process results in what is called a feature map. All the different elements in a feature map are then fed into one neural network in parallel to make sense of it. On a side note, normally there would be one input neuron per segment of the feature map here, but this wouldn't fit on the screen. The neural network uses the features to conclude that there is a bird in the image. So essentially we have two parts, the seeing part or the eyes of the neural network and the brain making the conclusions. But what if the bird doesn't look like this, but like this or like this? Or what if it is not a bird at all, but an airplane or an asteroid crashing onto the earth endangering all of humanity? As you may know, neural networks are trained with a lot of data. And these convolutional neural networks for object detection are trained on a lot of images. A lot. Take the Cypher 10 dataset for example. It consists of 80 million tiny images all labeled with 10 categories. So for each image, the dataset tells us whether it is an airplane, an automobile, a bird, a cat, a deer, a dog, a frog, a horse, a ship or a truck. But we cannot simply test for all 80 million different images in all positions on an image. Or can we? Instead of looking for a bird, the neural network looks for wings, a head, feathers, eyes and if it finds enough of these features, it can conclude it is indeed a bird. We know now that we need to look for certain features. But how do we detect features? To illustrate that, consider this very basic example. Let's imagine our job is to detect a forward slash or a backward slash in a tiny image. And it's actually a pretty tiny image. Only 2x2 two two pixels featuring only black and white pixels. We have a white forward slash and a white backward slash. White being represented by 1 and black by 0. The first naive idea is to add up all the pixel values, but this gives us the same result for both images. The same is true for subtracting all the values. After a couple of tries, we figure this out. If we take the negative of the first pixel, add the second and the third pixel and subtract the fourth pixel, we get 2 for the forward slash and negative 2 for the backward slash. So this is detecting a forward slash and when we negate all the signs, we can also detect a backward slash. Well done! We now have two feature detectors. What we actually do here is multiply the first and the fourth pixel with negative one and the second and the third pixel with one for the forward slash detector and the other way around for the backward slash detector. To illustrate this a little bit better, let's extract these coefficients into matrices of size 2x2. Two two. These matrices are called filters or kernels and we can now see that the forward and the backward slash patterns are visible in them. Actually with everything that we saw before with the bird and the colored squares being in a feature map, maybe you guessed it already, but we don't get colored squares. We actually get vectors for each of these squares describing different features like are there feathers, is there a head, does it have wings, etc. But there is one more thing here. We do not want to get negative values. A negative value is still a value, right? So we use a function that only outputs positive values and the rest should be null. This is called an activation function and we apply this after the feature detector and voila! No more negative values. Specifically, this is the relo activation function and if you've been around machine learning for a while, you'll see it everywhere. Let's see how it works with two other images. A full black one and a full white one. Easy, no slashes were detected. Two by two pixels is cool, but how do we apply our filters to larger images? Here's an example of a four by four image with two slashes. 
One idea would be to apply our filter to each 2x2 quadrant of the image. We then get 8 results, 4 for the forward slashes and 4 for the backward slashes and we can clearly see there was one forward slash detected and one backward slash. Nice! But what happens if a forward slash is exactly in the middle? Now our forward slash detector is not really sure if it is a forward slash. We only get an activation value of 1 for 2 of the quadrants. I guess we could live with that in this simple example and our neural network brain would figure it out. But keep in mind, we don't want to detect forward and backward slashes in small images, but real objects in big images. So we need a better way. Instead of simply applying our filters to the four quadrants, we can use a sliding window going over the image, detecting forward and backward slashes everywhere. Now we get a 3x3 feature map as a result for each filter and can clearly see there is a forward slash in the center. And the output of our filters is a 3x3x2 three-dimensional matrix. A new feature map. This process is called convolution and neural networks that use this technique are called convolutional neural networks. We have just defined a convolutional layer that takes a 4x4 feature map with black and white pixels as the features and outputs a 3x3 feature map where the existence of forward and backward slashes are the features. But how do we go from detecting forward and backward slashes to more complex images? Here we have two images of 3x3 pixels containing multiple forward and backward slashes. Applying our convolution layer, we get the correct results. But it's not only slashes, these images show an X and an O. As we have just defined a convolution layer that takes in 3x3 pixels as a feature map, we can now define a new convolution layer that takes our 2x2x2 feature map of forward and backward slashes and outputs a feature map for X's and O's. I left the coefficients for the new convolutional layer out for you as homework. Nah, I'm just kidding. All of these are trainable parameters and the neural network figures them out on its own during training. That is the magic of machine learning. Modern convolutional networks indeed utilize many stacked convolution layers to progress from pixels to shapes to parts of a face and finally to faces. This is how a neural network can see and extract concepts from an image, which we then can feed as a feature map to our neural network brain to do whatever it wants with it. However, there is still a problem. In this example, our feature detectors have detected a bird. We feed all the different elements of our feature map to the input neurons of our feedforward neural network brain. We have trained it very well, so all the right neurons activate to come to the conclusion that there is indeed a bird in the image. So one specific neuron receives the feature information for a bird, but what happens if the bird is here? Now different neurons receive the bird feature information. If we have enough training examples for birds being in different positions, that might work. But what happens if we also want to detect and classify other types of objects? We would need training examples for them as well in many different places and sizes. But there is a solution called pooling. Take for example this image. Our convolution layer detected different features for sky, water, rocks, birds and airplanes. Each feature has a different certainty score. Pooling means we look at different segments of our feature map and select the most interesting features. This way we reduce the dimensionality, both the width and the height of our feature map. To do that we use a filter again, but this time we take the most prominent feature or the feature about which the convolution layer was most certain and save it to our new feature map. And by using a larger feature in stride we dramatically reduce the dimensionality. We went from a 12 by 8 by 5 feature map to a 3 by 2 by 5 feature map. This reduction also reduced the needed number of input neurons in our feedforward neural network brain, which makes it faster, easier to train with fewer examples and less susceptible to objects being in different positions or having a different size. This is why in convolutional neural networks convolution layers are followed by pooling layers to reduce the dimensionality going from one abstraction step to the next. 
Here we can see the dimensions in the VGG16 neural network go from 224 by 224 by 3 for the input image down to 7 by 7 in terms of height and width. But with 512 extracted features for each element in the feature map before it goes into the feed forward neural network to make sense of it. If you want to implement and train your first convolutional neural network in PyTorch or TensorFlow now, choose one of these videos. Until then, have a lot of fun coders.